helps me begin to wrap my head around it. So what is justice? Justice is giving someone what is owed them. That's the classical definition of justice. You know, in a, in a court, that's what a court is about. You know, whether it's a murder case or a, something about money or whatever the case, we're trying to figure out what happened, and then we're trying to figure out who is in debt or who's responsible, who owes someone else something. You know, whether it's money or, or other things. And then the, what the court's job is to say, now you have to either pay the money or you have to go to prison or you have to, something has to happen to rebalance things, right? So justice is about what is owed someone. Mercy, I feel, is the one we misunderstand. Mercy, we sometimes talk about mercy as if it's a sort of laziness. Like, oh, we just, we won't investigate. Oh, we won't bother. I'm just going to forgive you. I'm just going to let it all slide. But what mercy, I think, really is when you, there's certain Bible passages, I don't have them present in front of me, but um, Jesus talks about mercy, or even the word forgiveness. What is forgiveness? We use it actually in the financial world. You forgive a loan, or you forgive a debt. So mercy is saying, you no longer owe me anything. Even though, according to justice, you owe me something, I am releasing you from that debt. There's that parable, you know, the rich man who releases the steward from his debt. So in one sense, it's impossible, even though they seem to contradict, the reality is we can't separate them. If you don't know what justice is, or you, if you don't know what something is, what is owed, mercy won't exist. Because mercy is predicated on, I know something is owed. I know something is out of balance. And then I'm forgiving that debt. So the only reason God is merciful is because he's perfectly just. God knows the good and the bad we've done. And that's what allows him to also then be merciful. And God, you know, so they're, they're do you see what I'm saying? They're, they're inherently tied together. Uh, if you have justice and you try to not have mercy, then you don't have justice, you just have like, um, just like, uh, I'm failing to find the word I want, but it's, it's like a machine essentially. Because even human justice, even human courts, we recognize that the law says when this crime is committed, there's a range. Maybe it's as bad as life in prison, maybe it's only so many years. And part of the judge's job is to say, it's not just an algorithm. When it comes down to it, there's a human involved. So I pick which of the range of sentences where justice is at. So if you don't have a component of mercy, you don't actually ever have justice. You just have like this black and white set of rules that just like chops down everything. And then like I said earlier, if you try to have mercy, but you try to overlook justice or skip justice, you end up not having mercy. You just have sort of a free-for-all. And then there's people who will remain kind of they're owed something, and they never get, you know, recompense. So there's, there, you can't separate them, even though they, like I said, they seem to contradict. So it doesn't fully explain how it's going to be on the judgment, you know. And I think that's why I leave it to God. That's above my pay grade. So um, here's the interesting thing. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm keep going on. We're, we're getting past time, but um, in my ministry, there is a point where I act as judge. We always talk about the priest as like acting in the place of the shepherd or you know, he's presiding at liturgy. But when the priest puts on, and I always carry it with me, when I put on my confessional stole and I sit in the confessional, I am acting in the place of Christ the judge. Isn't that an interesting thing to think about? That I, and it's, it's humbling to me, like I am now going to sit here and people are going to come and give their sins to God and I in a sense judge them. That's remarkable. But then the other remarkable thing is when you think about it, what's the sentence that I'm allowed to give? What's the range? It goes from mercy to mercy, right? You know, the whole point of this justice of God is forgiveness. And when you come to the confessional, the guarantee is that so long as you do all the steps, you know, you're truly contrite, you confess all your sins, you do all those things, you receive God's mercy. So even in the confessional, there, you can't separate them. God's justice is that we know that we've sinned and we know we've done wrong and we have to have contrition. And then the mercy of God is if we have that contrition, He always is there.
What? To be judged like that. Somebody says right. they killed somebody. Hold on. Oh. Everybody's going to hear you. Oh, she's, you won't eat that. Go ahead. <laughs> I said, that'd be a terrible place to be. When somebody comes in and says, you know, I raped a child or I killed somebody. I can't imagine your role is that. But God's mercy is greater. That's the most amazing thing. Isn't wow. it incredible? Now, the human side of me might be thinking, man, what a terrible person. I, no, I don't ever think about that in confession. So, but God's response to us is always mercy. But again, but again, to not go to the other extreme of like, well, then it doesn't matter, I can sin, and it's like... But God also knows whether we're contrite. God will only... He gives us the forgiveness when we seek it. And that's why Catholics are so concerned about how we live. Because at the end of the day... The way we lived, our actions are the like the only thing that's left or that's real. So when we look at you know our lives, when God sees our lives, He either sees that we loved Him or we didn't. And I can't come up with that yeah. equation, but He can. He can see into the heart. He knows whether we loved Him or not. So the other thing, though, don't ever have anything to fear. If you are going to confession, if you are going to mass, you should not have any fear. You should not have like because sometimes I see Catholics that are. Am I going to make it to heaven? I'm, to, I'm like, well, it's a very simple thing. Are you going to Mass or are you going to confession? If the answer is no, I say start. And if you are, then I say keep going and you'll be fine, you know. Um, so it's, uh, it's, you know, it's like, I don't understand why people get so worked up. It's like the steps are clear. Just do, you know, Jesus gave it to us. Do what he said. Like like Mary said at, um, at the Cana, you know, do whatever he tells you. You know, just follow the Lord and, and it works out. So, Yeah. Oh, there's some over there. We were talking about these folks that don't know Jesus. Mm -hmm. What is your take on them if they die before they die? Oh, okay. Very good question. So, the, um, the catechism, and it's not just the catechism, it's been in church teaching for a long time, even to the very early fathers. Salvation subsists in Christ, in the Catholic Church. Or sometimes it's phrased in the negative. No salvation is found outside of Christ. Now, the Church then follows it up, as we always do. We always throw in mercy. Um, if people, through no fault of their own, have never known Christ, you know, the, you know, you have the classic examples, the person who lives in Siberia in 188, you know, they had, they had no chance. Um, God, you know, obviously, God doesn't judge us on what is impossible for us, what we could not have, you know, come to know. And again, God knows our hearts. Um, but it goes even, you know, you don't have to go to that sort of extreme um, case. The church would say, you know, if someone was raised because of their family or their different situations to be entirely anti-Catholic, entirely against God, but they strive to be the best person they could in their own in their own sort of framework, then we entrust them to God's mercy and we hope that there is a there is there there is a chance for their salvation. But that doesn't make the previous statement untrue that salvation only comes from Christ. If that person is saved, even though they didn't know Christ, that doesn't stop God and Christ from knowing and loving them. So even if they are saved. They're saved because of Christ's power and because of his death on the cross. So it's always still through Christ. So um, Now, of course, there's that one passage in the gospel, to those who have been entrusted, more will be expected. So all of you and I, we've heard about Christ, so we've got to work harder. We've got to work harder. We've got to do a good job. But, but the, 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 to counterbalance that, we know Christ. Stop and think about that a second. We've been given more. Isn't that usually a good thing? Aren't you like, yeah, give me more. Yeah, I, I like more money, or I like more pizza, or I like, you know. So we shouldn't think, oh, sometimes we fall into, oh, wow, you know, maybe life would have been easier if I didn't know about all this stuff, and then I could have just been ignorant, and God would have forgiven me at the end. But it's like, hold on a second. We have God already. God, we already know about God's love. We're already getting little tastes of heaven in our going through the sacraments. So, like, we're the ones that are blessed because we're getting, we're starting heaven early in one sense. Or at least we are if we engage into our faith in that way. So, 
Um, I don't know. There's a lot more complexity to that issue, though, of like how do you, people are saved if they don't believe in Christ or they don't. Um, but that's like this. That's the basic outline of it. Is that the only way to be saved is through Jesus, and in other cases, outside the church, God is not limited. Um, you know, His mercy can go beyond, uh, can go anywhere. But at the same time, God has set up like the ordinary operation of the Holy Spirit in our world is the sacraments. So why would you go to something extraordinary or something bizarre or strange if the guaranteed version was right in front of you, right? Like if your doctor said, hey, we've got this, this cure for this cancer that you're dealing with, and it works pretty good. It's, it's actually a surefire. Or you can go up to, to Mayo and they'll give you some really experimental thing. You're like, no, 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 I want the one that works, you know. That's how we should view our faith. Like, we know that the sacraments work. We know that Christ is at work in, in through the Holy Spirit. So, we got to take the sure shot, you know. And that's why we want to be missionaries. Because even though we hope in God's mercy and we trust God's mercy, I want as many people as possible to get the 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 nice straight and narrow, the good, the guarantee, you know, the, the stuff that's that works. Because we know, and we know it works because it comes from God. You know, God's the one who gave us the sacraments. So. Anyway, I get kind of passionate about that topic, so, yeah. Somebody said go run. I can't run. <laughs> Father, uh, wasn't the uh, phrase, uh, no salvation outside the church, wasn't that declared a heresy? No, that's still in church doctrine. So what about the good Baptists and the good Methodists? Exactly. So they are... They are not in, so they're not in communion with the church, you know. They're not in the proper relationship with the vicar of Christ, the Pope, you know, who we believe has been handed on that ministry of guiding the church. Um, but back good, our good Baptist brothers and sisters, um, they've been baptized. And if they've been validly baptized, whether they know it or not, they actually are part of the church. They're part of a church that's not fully in communion, and that there's issues, and there's a whole, you know, you could go through the theology of all that, but anyone who's been baptized, if it's a proper baptism, it's almost like we get to claim them, whether they know it or not. Like, you're, you're, you're on our team. You're, you're Catholic in that sense, if you've been baptized. So... Exactly, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you got baptized in the name of the Sanctifier and the Creator and the Redeemer, then I'm sorry, you weren't baptized. We have to rebaptize you. Yeah. But if you followed the Trinitarian baptism, you're... So anyway, do you have a follow-up or another? Wait, yeah, so then what about the good Jews? But you're saying if, sure. if people come to... If people are with Christ, but what about the good Jews? That's a good question. So, well, in our Good Friday liturgy... Um, I always love to go back to the liturgy, because remember, lex orandi, lex credendi. What we pray is what we believe. It's not the other way around. It's not that we believe stuff and then we make prayers that show our beliefs. It's we, we pray this, and then that teaches us uh, what we believe. In the Good Friday um, service, because it's not a Mass, that's the only day of the year we don't have Mass. In the Good Friday service, in the universal prayer, there's ten things that we pray for each Good Friday. And it, that's the part you probably remember it. Let us kneel, let yeah. us stand, you know. The part that you're like, oh man, I don't like this part. My knees hurt, you know. <laughs> that's an incredibly rich moment in our year, though, because we pray for all the things. And one of the prayers, one of those ten prayers, is dedicated solely to the Jewish people. And in those prayers, what we pray is that um, we acknowledge that they, we kind of spiritually indebted to them because salvation, God's salvific plan and bringing us the Messiah and all, it started with them. So even though they haven't like, you know, haven't gone along with us or some of them have not recognized Christ, um, in our prayer we pray that they will, um, you know, essentially that God will still watch over them and of course we hope that they'll come to know Christ. But again, I think that's a case where we, we begin to rely on God's mercy because God knows that the whole reason maybe some of them don't acknowledge Christ is because they're trying to do their best to be faithful to the covenant. And it's, of course, a covenant with God. So 
Again, I'm glad I'm not God because I would do a terrible job of judging everyone's heart. But um, so yeah, no, we would we would hope and pray that the Jews would be saved, and we do every every Good Friday. So, um, it, it, but like I said, it's a complex issue because, and that's I think a healthy tension. We should always have this tension, like because we want to respect the good other people are doing. Because again, we believe that even if you're not Christian, even if you're not Catholic, that you're trying. The people strive to do good. But at the same time, Jesus, I think he was pretty clear at the end of Matthew's Gospel, go and announce the Gospel to all peoples. He didn't say go to announce it to all peoples except those who already have beliefs or ideologies, right? Go announce to all people and baptize all of them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there's always this tension as Catholics. We always respect, we always put the, you know, uh, you know we, we believe in, in being kind and respectful of other people's beliefs, but at the same time, we want them all to be baptized. We want them all to join um, the people of God. So, again, these are kind of very complex issues. But these are wonderful questions. So. Or even the good Muslim who mentions Mary in the Quran over right. 25 times, more than in the Bible. Yes, no, that's true. The, the, the people of um, who believe in Islam or who are Muslims, um, they're not baptized, so they don't have, you know, that sort of, they're not, they wouldn't be like our Baptist brothers and sisters, you know. And, um, but we do call them one of the Abrahamic religions because they, in their own way, trace Abraham as their father in faith. So, um, yeah, again, it, it's actually in the Catechism, it's not in the Catechism, it's actually in one of the Vatican II documents. There's actually, if you read it, and I think it's in Lumen Gentium, um, it actually kind of, it's like, lays out the whole structure. It's like the church is in the middle, then it's Orthodox and Eastern churches that are not in union with Rome, but have valid sacraments. And then the next circle is uh, other Christians that are baptized, and then the next circle is Jews, and then actually Muslims get their own separate category. Because the, it, the church recognized that they still are a monotheistic religion, and they still trace their roots back to Abraham. So you're not dealing with the same thing as a pagan who like believes in many gods, or someone who's an atheist who doesn't believe in any god. So it's interesting that in, in Vatican II, there's a they acknowledge that there's a different um, they kind of have their own unique standing. So yeah. But, so uh, uh, Catholics are not allowed to support the Catholic Church. So you're saying that Orthodox, but that circle of people, um, their, their sacraments are valid? Um, some of the Eastern churches, yes, they have valid sacraments and valid orders. And that's why we call them in schism. Schism means you have all the stuff of being a real church. They are really a church, but they're in, they're in schism from Rome. They don't acknowledge the Pope. But in every other way, they have valid sacraments. And, um, because they were important. Because they can trace their priesthood and their bishops all the way back to the apostles, just like we can. So, um, interesting thing, the Anglicans, when they first broke off, kind of had valid orders in the Protestant Reformation. Because when they broke off, they brought a bunch of bishops. You know, King Henry made all the bishops go with. Um, but then what happened is they weren't very careful about um, making sure that their subsequent bishops were ordained properly. So we say that they've lost their holy orders and their sacraments. Because then, of course, now we know Anglicans, they have, um, well, that, that's a whole spectrum. You know, some, some groups are very traditional. Other groups have, you know, women um, ordinations and, and, you know, uh, different different things have, have really changed in some other beliefs. So. But it's interesting how, yeah, a, the difference between a schismatic group or a Protestant group or a, you know, a heretical group, there's, it means different things. So We're really going down rabbit holes, I'm sorry. I, 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 I love chasing down things. So. And I think the topic was uh, missionaries in the Eucharist. So if we ever want to talk about missionaries or Jesus, that'd be great. You know? So no, but all the questions are welcome. Yeah. Well, this is going closer. Extreme. 
Yeah, I mean, that's ultimately what we do. We rely on God's mercy. Um, so in one sense, they're very different from us, again, because of these beliefs. But in another sense, they're very much like me. Because guess what? I'm also relying on God's mercy. Like, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm sure hoping that I get some of God's mercy. And I, and I try to go to confession as often as I can, so I keep getting God's mercy. So, so in one sense, we're totally different, because, you know, but in one sense, we're all relying on God's mercy. So... Hmm? Yes. Yeah. Also, one other thing. So again, just since we broached this topic, so there's Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, some of those national churches. They're in schism with us, but actually, there are 23 Eastern churches that are in communion with us. So there are 23 groups of different rites of the church out in the East that are fully Catholic. They acknowledge the Pope. They're they're our brothers and sisters. They they have slightly different liturgies and because you know they're and different customs, but uh, like the Syro Malabar rite or the Byzantine rite or the, the the different there's twenty like I said twenty three of them. So it's pretty cool. Like we have such a diverse um, you know truly Catholic faith. Catholic means universal, but that's I think the best example of the faith being universal is that it's so diverse you know there's so many different expressions of the same faith so anyway any other questions or are we probably we're getting worn out so okay <laughs> they're telling me we're done we're done it's not the, you know you know you know we should actually we should actually pray um we should pray for Saint Genesius's intercession because he's a patron saint of a bunch of things, including victims of torture. So, um, <laughs> what's, what's the question? Saint Genesius or Genesius. So, that's always a good. We you know how Saint Jude. He's the patron saint of impossible things. You can throw that in as a Catholic joke. Another Catholic joke is Saint Genesius, the patron saint of victims of torture. You can throw that in. You know, Saint Genesius, pray for us when. Uh, Someone's talking too long. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. Of course, we need to give a round of applause to, to Father Gregory for an awesome job. Oh, God yes. bless him. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I do have a couple of an announcements here. Next week, we have the Eucharistic Miracles by Deacon Michael Green. And also, on your way out, we have the coasters that are available, and also a free will offering. And I'd like to end with a prayer, if I could. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. As we close this meeting, Lord, we want to give honor to you. Thank you, God, for the time we had today to discuss the Eucharist. May you bless each person who took the time to gather here today and let your hand of protection be on them throughout the rest of the week. Let the work done here tonight come to fruition, and let it all be for your glory. Help us each to do our parts to bring what we learned to others. Amen. 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 Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, Lord, I, I am so stiff, I can't really move. I know. I have to get up and kind of around a little bit. Oh, let the oil run down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is. Thank you. Try it. Try it. Pray for me. I need all the help. I will. Okay. Six o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even know what was looking at there. I don't know. Save the camera. No, you don't have cards.
also feel like I want to err on the side of being a missionary. Because, you know, in the judgment, there's a person that. Hi, Merrick. I got one. Hello, Mother Catherine. Okay. Right now we got a beautiful picture. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that thing still running? And I 